Ladies and gentlemen, we are live! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the MMA Opinion Podcast. My name is Liam O'Griffin, joined as always by Mr. Paul O'D. How are things? And on this week's episode, we are going to be talking about Karolina Kowalkiewicz's mental health admissions, some new fight announcements, and we go in-depth on MMA refereeing and judging with our live studio guest, Derek Hickey. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Well, and... What else we got? We've got lots to be getting on with, so let's be getting on. I want to fuck. I want to fight with Chuck. Fuck Chuck. I think he just blew his wad there. Anderson Silva, you uh, have every week to mess up his intro. I'm not even gonna pretend I got it right this week. <laughs> Forget about it. This Forget is a, this about is an ongoing joke in the studio. One of three of our intros, Liam gets right, and uh, he has his own catchphrase in the intro, and he just can't get it right. You Every should, single week. Record it. Yeah, if we had a pre-record, but there'd be no fun in that then, though. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. I get a giggle out at the start of the episode every, almost every week. Come here, I'm, if he keeps talking about me, I'm going to go the same way as Car- Carolina Kovial Kid. Oh, Jesus, Kiewicz. that's dark. That's a dark, dark. Uh, segue there. So, um, so, yeah, so this is the news of uh, Carolina uh, talking this week about uh, her mental health struggles following her slew of losses. So she she had a she had those two epic fights with JJ. Well, yeah. it, one was a, a rematch of an earlier one, obviously. Yeah. But um, after that, then she kind of dropped a few few losses in a row. She lost to uh, Yan Zhaonan. Yan Zhaonan, yeah. And most recently, she lost to was it Michelle Waterson? Did she lose to Michelle, Michelle Waterson or Rosa Rose Namajunas? Rose Namajunas. So yeah. she had, I, I think she had about three or four losses in a row. Yeah. And uh, she talked uh, about, you know, not, not only being depressed, but actually making a few suicide attempts. And yeah. um, I suppose it's kind of like, you, you kind of, you kind of feel for her, obviously. I mean, Jesus Christ, yeah. that the pressure was unreal. Like, I mean, she's, she's an elite level athlete. She's only been kind of knocked off her, her uh, knocked off her stride by other elite level athletes. Yeah. Why should anybody feel like this? But obviously the pressure is on, you know. So where's that pressure 100%. coming from? It's she's obviously putting some pressure on herself, but there must be some trolls in her in her fan page. There must be some uh pressure from maybe fans to for her to be the next big thing and whatever. But uh just very sad to see and um important for her to highlight it as well because it's, yeah. it's she, she's obviously not on her own there. But um yeah, did you did you what what did you make of the like I, I I don't know. Like there was no nod to the fact that it was anything outside of the the losing the fights that she had. So I imagine ninety percent of it or most of it, if not all of it, was internal pressure she was putting on herself. Mm. And like you said, we we touched on it. She went from that girl that everyone said, right, this is the girl that could take on JJ, and yep. she was right there, number two in the world for a while, to all of a sudden she's she's become almost a gatekeeper very quickly mm. for for that top five, top six. Um, but the division has has changed so drastically over the last two years, and there's so many contenders there. Um, but like you said, it, it's it takes some bravery to come out and actually release the fact that she's had those issues and mental health issues. Yeah. So a big big nod to her for that, and we just wish her well and hope all is, all is good in the future. And Derek, you've been like obviously in the cage when when fighters are handed a loss or they're they're kind of a, des- a decision goes against them. You can see the anguish in their eyes. You can see how much it means to them. Like, have you? Are, does this surprise you that uh, a fighter would be feeling like this, or or would you have come across it before? I think, well, as a referee, just bring the microphone closer <laughs> to you. Just bring it to you. Yeah, I'm new to this. <laughs> um, as a referee, like, I, I I just allow you. You obviously there's when that fight's over or you've stopped the fight, you you can just see it in their eyes, like yeah. heart, they're heartbroken or they're you know. Um, but I try not to make too much. Like a lot of people, just like to deal with it in their own way. You know, you check if they're okay, and then you just you just leave them to it. Some of them just want to sit there. Others want to their their corner to come in. The last thing they'd want for me as a referee is to be on top of on the top situation of them while they're yeah. dealing with it. You know, um, the same as you know, there's a stoppage, and the the fighter is angry, or you know, he's going to the first person he's going to blame is is me or yeah. or the referee. Like you know, that's that's it's find somebody to blame, and I'm the person. Yeah, that that is going to blame it on. I know for about ten seconds after you stopped my fight, I blamed you anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure like that's He's not bitter at all, Derek. He hasn't just gone three episodes in a row talking about the stoppage. 
<laughs> Everybody hates me in Ireland. It's, just, it's, it's always my fault. But um, it wasn't that I sat my head into a guillotine or anything, but it, it was probably your fault as well. Like, yeah, yeah. Next time I might leave it going a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, so you you just have to leave with deal with them in their own way, and you know your your job is to keep them safe. You know, other than that, once that 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 that's finished, then my job's done, and I just have to leave with them. Yeah, of course. Be upset or be angry or... But it is, I, I, I think, like, it's something that, especially at that level, when you get to that almost there, but not quite there, there must be that pressure in, in within yourself to get to the belt, mm. to lose at almost what would be the final hurdle to these athletes of, of their lifetime goal. Mm. To get so far and fall at the last hurdle, it must be crippling... And then, like you say, to have a series of losses after, to feel like it's never you're never getting back there, maybe. But the thing is, as well, is that uh, th- th- this comes from the I, I don't know is it the it's the trend in professional MMA, particularly UFC, that after two losses you get, you get cut. So there's a, yeah. a tremendous amount of pressure. Now you don't get that in any other. Um, sport, not even in boxing, you, like uh, guys can go three or four losses. They're not going to get cut. They may not command the same amount of money, but they won't get cut. Yeah. Um. But it it just ha- so happens, and particularly from the UFC, as I said. But that actually in Ireland filtered down to the amateur, um, MMA scene very very early on. Like I I, I fought an amateur. I only had a couple of fights at amateur. I had three fights, three losses in a row. Shouldn't have I shouldn't have been fighting in the first place because I wasn't ready. But yeah. uh, it took me a long time to figure that out. But even after two losses, people were telling me I should retire. I was a fucking yeah, amateur. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, an, an amateur Madness. athlete, just, just doing this in, in like part-time as a hobby, and then you you lose two fights and people are saying, oh, Jesus, it's time to hang the gloves up. That comes from the original UFC kind of uh, trend of people being cut after two fights. Yeah. And that has now perpetuated onwards to the to the point where um, Carolina, even though she fought her ass off after a couple of losses, I think it was three losses, um, and and ma- and made the majority of them competitive. Absolutely, sure. She, she it was a decision against um, uh, JJ for sure. Anyway, I'll have to go back yeah. and check what what, what the other uh, outcomes were. But, I know she, she did was get never, finished once or twice, but yeah. But back in your day, Liam, you were learning most of your MMA off YouTube. Yeah, YouTube wasn't even a thing when I, I was learning <laughs> off VH, VHS tapes. So I mean, things have progressed, you know. But yeah. that's like I. But the mentality hasn't though. They, there is still that stigma. If you lose a few fights in a row, people just think, "All right, they're done." Yeah. Like even we look at, and, and I know I'm guilty of it. There's certain fighters in the UFC, and I, I always nod to a fella that's got two two fight losing streak, and he might be fighting a fella that has two, lost two out of three, and I'll always dub it as a loser leaves town fight. But there's all, there's such a, there's such a queue of. Of up and coming fighters to get into the yep. UFC, that hundred percent, you know, that that's it. Like if you if you're not making the cut, you're just gone. Yeah. But in your defense, Paul, you're you're saying that because you know that that is the trend, the trend not because yeah. you're creating a trend. You know, yeah. you're you're not the one that's setting that trend. That 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 just is what has happened and what continues to happen. Look at Reese McKee recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like poor fella got uh, um, Hamzat in Hamza his debut in on his, short notice. Yeah, like what a start to 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 a fight career, and then just a few weeks later, then a twelve um, fight veteran, Brandon Moreno, like that, and, and, then, and now and now that that chance of, of fighting for the premier organization is gone for the foreseeable future. Yeah, he's going to have to work his way back, and I'm sure he will. Yeah, but yeah. um, such a like such a a dog eat dog game. I'm 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 not so. My point is, I'm not surprised yeah, yeah. that the likes of Carolina puts so much pressure on herself and I'm sure this is not rampant. an isolated case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. rampant. And uh, maybe I, I don't know what, what can we do about it. I don't think there's anything you can do about it unless the UFC changes its policy on, on who gets caught and well what I, I think lost. the fact that this is such such a kind of a she's in the spotlight. She's well liked across the MMA world. Um, and in even in the UFC, after losing so many fights, there was never talk of her being cut because she was still a contender up there. Mm. Um, the fact that this is in the spotlight right now might be time for them to provide some kind of mental health training or some or support available to all their fighters, something along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. they have the PI, but they need to branch out, and maybe they do have something like that available to them. I don't know, but I haven't heard of it yet. Anyway, yeah, yeah. I haven't heard of it. 
So you have other fights um, that have been announced. Um, there's a couple of days there that I'm not really familiar with. You're, you're more familiar with them. So yeah, so we, we have, we were talking about coming up to the summer, what titles we were going to see on the line. And we knew, of course, that the two flyweight titles would more than likely feature. And both have been booked this week. So you have Valentina Shevchenko is going to defend her title against Jessica Andrade, which was kind of the, the obvious choice there at £125. And in the men's flyweight title, you have... Davison is going to rematch against Brandon Moreno after the draw towards the end of last year. So two phenomenal matchups, but one is on 261, one is on UFC 262. I can't see either being a main event. 263 for this one and um, the Moreno one? Apologies, 262 and 263, you're right. But I can't, I, I can't see either of them being a main event of a pay-per-view card. Generally, they won't with the flyweights, so... It'd be interesting to see what. But that's a rematch as well. That match, that, that first match was a cracker. So, you know, they might take a might take a risk on that one. I doubt it. No, a, a June card. Yeah, that's that's right in the middle of fight week, is it? July, July, July fight week, fight week. week. Well, this year's fight week was actually January UFC two fifty seven. They called that International Fight Week. It's usually July 9th, I think. I yeah, um, but. I look. I could be wrong. Maybe that is their intention because they've all the belts kind of tied up for the next couple of months. But that that I'd imagine there's something in the works to headline both those cards. So, but they are two great fights. And the other one of note that was booked as well this week is Daniel Wolf, who uh, moved to one and zero after making the transition over from amateur boxing on Dana White Contender Series. Now she looked good on Dana White Contender Series against a girl that kind of with. She had more experience in her. I believe she was four and one or four and oh. Mm-hmm. Um, but not the stiffest test, certainly not UFC caliber test. And she got a decision victory. Mm-hmm. And this is a girl with 30 amateur, 30 and oh as an amateur boxer. She has multiple US titles, but she's going in against, in, in her USC debut against Felicia Spencer at 145 pounds. Spencer is an elite wrestler and grappler. Like it's just, it strikes me as very strange. It's a tough matchup, yeah. But like this is a good looking girl, a girl you could easily market, someone new for £145. Mike Jackson maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, why put her in a, in there against probably one of the, the top contenders in that division right off the bat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very so, strange. So um, just for anybody watching in, what do you reckon? Do you think that um, that flyweight boat could be a main event? And um, are you concerned that they're feeding... Uh, this young boxer, what's her Daniel name? Daniel Wolf. Daniel Wolf. Are, are they feeding her to the to the wolves? Oh my god! Oh, oh, my awful god. pun. Because I I didn't actually I didn't I, I missed the pun myself. I had it out before I realized it yeah, was. Yeah, I don't believe you. Yeah, you love okay. a pun. I know, sure. <laughs> but um, yeah. So um, that's is that the news items? That's news. That's covered. news items. So, Mister Hickey, we're going to turn the tables on you. So You're in the for spotlight now. So for. The audience li- listening in that might not know Mr. Hickey, um, Derek is a, a referee, um, international referee at the IMAF 2019 World Referee of the Year, uh, as presented by uh, Mr. Mark Goddard. And um, we actually have a picture of that on the on the page there th- th- this afternoon. or Yeah, this afternoon you put it up, was it, Paul? Yeah. Um, so y- you started out on, obviously, uh, training here at SBG Cork and then... Uh, you you kind of did a couple of courses and got into it and started started from the bottom and worked your way up. Do you want to give us a quick kind of an overview as to uh, we say what were the starting events? What was the first uh, seminar you went to and and how did it progress from there? Um, my first kind of dealing with with uh, being unofficial was the weekend of the McGregor Brando fight in Dublin, um, and I think I seen on on the. Facebook that Mark Goddard was holding a seminar in SPG in Dublin. Um, it wasn't, like, it wasn't, it wasn't a course, but it was more of a seminar and and just outlining what it took to be an official and scoring criteria and um, that was pretty much it. Like and it went on for a couple of hours and we got a certificate at the end of it and you know I was I was happy out, but back then there was there was no no judging or no no referee qualification. So I came back to Cork and we were, there was a, was it the martial arts, the Cork Martial Arts Expo? Yeah, the Expo was, was on that year, yeah. So um, there was novice, no headshots tournaments going on and, and Liam said to me, did I want to give refereeing a go? 
So I was like the most qualified in the gym then because <laughs> you were the most qualified <laughs> in the country. <laughs> so I had a certificate from Mark Goddard. So yeah. I, s- I said, we'll, we'll give it a go, you know. Gold star in his forehead. Really. <laughs> and a stamp. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I just I got kind of got stuck in there and helped out and refed a good few fights. Just got got a bit of experience. Yeah. Um, and I kind of kept going from there. So we had a few uh, novice shows inside in the gym as well where, where I used to do the same thing. Um, it was mostly trying to com- control Abadou Faris. Yeah, yeah. He didn't know that his headbutts. There was, <laughs> didn't know headbutts were illegal. He'd been training for about three years. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like as time went on, then I was I kind of got interested in it, and you know it was it was nice to have some sort of involvement or yeah, you know, in, in the sport. So uh, I I was looking out then, and I seen IMAF were after bringing out um, an officials course. So they wanted two years experience, um, a letter from your federation um, to apply. So I applied for actually two of them and they both got cancelled because the numbers in Ireland, t- there just wasn't enough people to to run the course or to make it visible. Yeah, yeah. So eventually I got it in Belfast. So Danny Corr was running was running it. Um, so I just went up for the weekend. I was probably one of the most least experienced people there. Yeah. Um, the likes of Deck Clark and... Um, Pete Lafferty, uh, Paul Couser, like everybody that was experienced officials. So we done the course and I got certified. Um, and that was just the beginning. That's just a piece of paper. It doesn't like you think you think you have a certificate you're able to ref, but like it couldn't be least from from the truth. Yeah. Uh, after that, then I just started working shows, judging, and a lot of them. Um, Cage Legacy Two, I think, was the first. First show that I done an amateur fight on, reft, um, and even at that stage I was still kind of I didn't think I had enough respect or I didn't ha- I hadn't earned enough respect in 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 the MMA world to yeah, yeah. to be in in between fighters because it's another thing you like you respect both fighters because they they earn it as soon as they step into the cage, whereas you've got to build it up over years and years and years for for them to f- feel like it's your job to keep them safe. Um, so if you don't have faith in yourself, how can you expect two fighters to have faith in you? Uh, and I went from there then, just started on the IMAF scene and like the, the experience you get on IMAF is at another level. Phenomenal, yeah. I've done nine IMAF tournaments now over three years. I must have refed, I'd say I'm hitting a thousand fights now at this stage between IMAF, Plan Wars, Cage Legacies, you know, shows... And any show that's in Ireland, really, the Wimp Warrior shows, yeah. And I'm still only learning, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. O- it's only the beginning. Like it's it's such a high ladder to climb, and but it's like anything else, I suppose, and, and particularly in martial arts, anything that you are going to do and do at a high level, you've got to put in the hours, you've got to put in the experience, or have the experience behind you to be to get to that level. Like. Yeah, and it's it's you you can only learn it from being in there. You can only watch back in your fights, you know, learn from yeah. your mistakes, make mistakes. I had sixteen hundred people booing me inside Neptune Stadium for, stop, <laughs> for stopping the fight. Liam seems to believe that I started that chant as well, which I definitely <laughs> didn't. But uh. you know, so I mean, I mean, lucky, lucky. I'm, uh, I, I'm not really worried about what people think. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, you need to be thick skinned yeah, for it, though. Thick skinned, and at the end of the day, our job is to keep the fighter safe. That's what we go in there to do. You know, we we make mistakes. You know, but as long as they, I'd rather stop a fight too early and both of them get out healthy and able to go again than. You know, leave it go on too long, and one of them get injured. Yeah. You know, yeah at the end of the day, a lot of them are amateur fighters. They've got college, they've got families, they've got jobs to go on to. And they're they're not getting paid for what they're doing no. as well, which so is a big part. Of it, sometimes yeah. they're so tough that you need to be the person that saves them from themselves rather than anything else. And here we are now, five, six, six years later, still trying to get a shot somewhere. It's yeah. you know. I've done as much as I can now at this stage, so it's 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 just getting getting get in line and and mm. and wait for a call from some of the big shows. Yeah. So you have you you have like a a bunch of professional fights ref now at this stage as well on Clan Wars and and, and a few other shows. Um, so, uh, you've had a couple of close calls. There was supposed to be a, a UFC card in Dublin in August last year. We were kind of hoping that 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 you'd be on that one, but uh, yeah. obviously, the pandemic had other um plans for you. And uh, uh, we tried to get you into the Bellator one as well. That didn't work. Either. Yeah. So I mean, it's it, within Ireland a lot. A lot of 
a lot of the problems, well, not problems, but it, it's more difficult because we don't have a legal commission. So when a big show comes to Ireland, like the UFC, um, Bellator, in a lot of countries where there is where there is a governing body, officials from that country then would would have to um, be working the shows. Yeah. Whereas Ireland, the commission they bring commissions in from other countries, from the US, from England. So it makes it much harder. Yeah. Um, but there's the, the people I work with, and I'm after. There's, there's a huge amount of officials, way more experienced than me. You know that should be getting getting yeah. shots on on the big show. So I just I just have to line up, and when the time comes, you yeah. know, as as people keep telling me, there's no shortcuts to it. So you just keep working, keep getting experience, and sometime it'll happen. But like like you said, Liam, about the events in Ireland in particular and that's where you more than likely will get your shot when it happens um, Ireland has become such kind of a hotbed for MMA and even like uh, I believe it was John McCarthy was talking about retur- when they do return to Ireland that he has a lot of friends that want to come over Bellator love putting on shows here UFC love putting on shows here so like there, there's certainly opportunities going to come your way down the road it's, it's, it's one of those um I don't know, like, it, it, it's not as if MMA is going anywhere at that level in Ireland. Yeah. You know, it, oh, it, there's going to be shows here in the next few years. Like. There's no, there's no, um, you can't, you, you can't make it happen. You just have to, yeah. to keep impressing people or keep, keep doing a good job. But and if, eventually it'll happen. But you, like, obviously you've got a, a great mentor in, in, um, in Mark Goddard and we have the photograph here of him presenting you with the prize for the 2019 Official of the Year Award. Like, what, what's it like having... Like Mark, you have on speed dial that you can, you know. Surprised he has me blocked by now. <laughs> <laughs> but he looks after you. He kind of he he'll give you a talking to if there's something not quite right, or he'll give you uh you know some congratulations if you if you've done done a good job. And he's 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 a mentor, really, isn't he? Yeah, it's and like, he's a mentor for a whole generation of yeah, new officials coming through. Uh, there, there, you can you can't find a better mentor in this in in, the, in the, on this planet right now. He's he's by far the best referee on earth at the moment yeah um and just to have him there to to you know send a text and ask little questions and mark's kind of person that doesn't like he won't he won't rub your ego yeah, as yeah. in you know if if you fuck up he let you know you fucked up um and his way of letting you know you're doing a good job is giving you a bit more responsibility you know he's never going to say oh great job and you know rub you on the head and say you know well done yeah yeah but but like the last two two IMAF World Championships now, I've been cage leader for. So I mean, little bits more where you're working, you're 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 overseeing a team of officials now rather than just being. I can remember walking to IMAF four years ago, and I was just a new guy, and you know, looking up to all all the lads that are actually working on my teams now. Yeah, and it's just a journey. It's a fun journey. Yeah. So we have a few questions that were uh, posted under that. That uh, topic that uh, Paul put up on the page earlier on. So will we will we ask those ones. Will we get will we get into those ones. Yeah, if you so want to pop it up there, my eyesight is absolutely brutal. You have Dylan Rayner who asked, uh, "Would he like to see the introduction of live scoring visible at the end of each round?" Um, I think that's going to happen and going to happen fairly soon. Uh, it's I'd say the next two or three years we're going to we're yeah. going to see a big kind of inflow of uh, live scoring. Uh, I also do think all officials should be answerable to to scores that they give. Obviously, not to the public or not to, but a coach or a fighter. If if they ask to see a scorecard or explain why the score was given, I think that's the least that we should be able to do for them. Yeah. All judges, especially at a high level, they're very experienced. You know, they didn't they didn't get to where they were by just picking a number out of a hat. They're they're around a very very long time and they're very good at what they do. Yeah. Um. So just because people don't agree with scores sometimes doesn't mean that that the scores are actually wrong. Yeah, of course. And I did see that LFA have actually. Now I I'm unsure as to whether I have this arseways, but that wouldn't be a big shock. But <laughs> I know LFA in their last few events have had the live in score round uh scoring come up in between rounds, and they actually put it up on on Fight Pass with the publication. But I think that could actually be more to do with the commission. The last few events have been on in Kansas. Yeah, I, th- I think that's one of their new uh, uh, policies that they do that anyway, regardless of the promotion. But I know I've seen it on LFA in the last few events. I also think that um, live scoring, if 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 corners know the scoring in between rounds, it'll push it can push fighters to 
you know, you're going into the third round and they can be 100% sure that they're losing. It gives them that yeah. that push. Um, to They have to finish the fight. It can make the fights more exciting. Yeah. Um, and, and it just gives them a bit of... Uh, I think it'll stop people from complaining about decisions afterwards as well. Do you know, like if they thought that they were like two, two, two rounds up and they were actually two rounds down and then it's at the moment that their hand is raised or not raised that they discover that they've, they've lost a the fight. Uh, we've had that like dozens of hundreds of times. But if they knew going into the third that they were already two rounds down, and then of they course have it's to not going to be the any. fight, and they yeah. still have that five minutes of opportunity. Yeah, and they they have done it in boxing, right? They, in the Olympics and boxing, they've they've had open scoring for boxing for 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 long a long time. time. Yeah, um, and it definitely made it made for exciting, more exciting spectator uh, participation because you knew exactly where 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 things are at. Now, you could argue that the educated audience should know where the rounds are going. Jesus, a lot of times there's there's a disagreement in in between um, individual judges, let alone the audience, and yeah, and yeah. the commentary team is on is on drugs most of the time. With, with well, well, <laughs> Joe Rogan, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not be on drugs here at the moment. I but think it's very difficult to actually be a commentator and score a fight at the same time. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's very hard to watch a fight and score a fight at the same time. Yeah, I can remember back in um, Romania, I think it was at the European Championships, Patrick Lehan. He had a fight, uh, and he lost. He lost the fight, and I was, I wasn't actually part. I was, I was an official at at the championships, but I wasn't had a no involvement in that fight because being a, a fellow team conflict member, of interest. Yeah. yeah, but I watched the fight, and I was, I was a hundred percent sure the judges had got it wrong, and I was, I was saying it to myself, oh no, he should have won the fight. And Pa said the same when he came out. And we went back to the hotel room that night, and we watched the fight. Two of us turned around straight away and. We just said you lost that fight. He goes, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's you know, there's watching a fight and they're scoring a fight. Mm. Yeah, and um, there, has, it, there has to be a difference between them. Even me and you, we we disagree all the time on mm. the scorings. And I know, like, so you score the fights the way they the, should the, be the scored. Right way, yeah. <laughs> and I scored them cynically <laughs> in the way that I perceived that the judges might score them, because I, 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 for my, in my opinion, I still think that that to a certain degree and to a certain element, that the old system is still. Uh, still to some extent is in there that control and um aggression still plays a part in scoring like late takedowns and rounds and stuff like that it shouldn't and it, like you can you can touch on the the, the newer scoring system and we discussed so like damage is a no-no word apparently but <laughs> effective yeah, striking and grappling it's, yeah if it's 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 fairly simple there's effective striking effective grappling that's what you score the fight on yeah. effective grappling isn't a takedown it's 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 gaining an attack from a takedown or gaining you know, a dominant position, so I mean you have to decide what what's effective and and what's ineffective. Same with striking. Um, you know it's it's for it's an immediate or an accumulative, you know, um, attacks. So yeah. uh, it's if 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 you can, if you can't score a fight from effective striking or grappling, that's the only reason. If it's a hundred percent even on the grappling and striking, then you move down to aggression. If it's a hundred percent on the aggression both ways, and you can't come up with a winner from that, that's when you move down to control. Yeah. If other than that, you don't bring aggression or control into the scoring of it. Um, so it's it's whoever's trying to finish the fight. That's it. Whoever's whether it's twenty five seconds, if there's a, a five minute round, and four minute thirty of it is one fighter just holding and controlling and doing nothing, and there's a thirty second blast from the opponent who's cutter and you know, trying to finish the fight, it's that fighter should win it. That's so, of course, you're talking about the Vieira and Kuniskaya fight from last week that um, we were kind of... It, it, it was... We both agreed at the time that it was it was definitely Kuniskaya's uh, fight, but there was controversy over it. Yeah. Certainly, uh, Vieira was a bit pissed off about it. Somebody's always pissed off, though. Only only can be one winner, and then the other person's yeah. pissed yeah, yeah. off. That's usually how it how it goes. But you, you're obviously in complete agreement about about that decision. I gave it uh, 29-28 uh, Kuniskaya, uh, rounds two and three to Kuniskaya, and I gave round one to Vieira. Um, you know, Vieira, she got a takedown. She spent two minutes just attempting to get mount. Yeah. And then she was just controlling. Uh, she, I think she went for two attempts with a rear naked choke and only half attempts at that. And other than that, she was just catching a seatbelt and, and just and, and just holding her. Um, Kuniskaya, she had four good leg kicks at the start. When she had her back taken, she was peppering back shots. 
they were effective enough over a cumulative amount of strikes. Yeah. And then for the last 25 seconds, she she got up, she had heavy elbows, she cut her, and she was the one attempting to finish the fight. Um, and that gave, well, that gave it around, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and, and that's it. Judges, judges are people and it's, it's, it's experience and it's an experienced opinion. That's, that's all they can give. Yeah. You know, so, um, sometimes people don't agree with it, but you know, you just have, to, you have to, you have to just, you just have to go with, go to go with what those judges think because that's their job and that's their profession. So, I mean, obviously just mistakes made, but yeah. And I know you touched on having a thick skin and there being mistakes and we actually have a question from Andy Hickey from the MMA opinion as well that something along those lines of uh, I suppose when you get do get to that big stage if you just want to give it a roll there and we'll sorry two seconds hey Derek there's a lot of controversy about referees lately every event on the world scene we seem to see questions online regarding performance, most notably Herb Dean uh, with Derek Lewis a couple of weeks ago. If you do make it to the big show in the UFC, how would you plan to deal with the scrutiny that comes with it? There's going to be world eyes on you, and you know, how do you manage that if the, there's negative reviews at times? Thanks for taking the question. Um, well, as a referee, we don't really like to comment on other individual referees, but as, as far as the Herb Dean um, stoppage last week, I, I thought Herb Dean had done a great job that stoppage he was he was in within a second yeah. you know um there's there's only so fast somebody can move yeah yeah um and i i can't i can't see what he done wrong there there was two shots landed after like after that that they were saying he was knocked out from the uppercut um and he probably was but but at the end of the day herb has to his brain has to assess the situation and he has to get to the fighter to stop it which he done as quick as possible yeah um and as far as uh, as far as myself, how do I deal with it? Like I get abuse all the time on <laughs> YouTube videos. You know, yeah. you know. Oh, stoppage was too early. Stoppage was too late. He missed that tap. Like people think referees have X-ray vision and they can see a tap under somebody's back. You know, we don't yeah. have four camera angles and we don't have we don't have instant replay and we can't sit there and look at the fight five different times. We've got a split second to to see what's happening and we've got a split second to react and, and make a decision um, decisions are always going to be made in the best interest of the fighter we want to keep them safe that's what we're there to do sometimes we get it wrong sometimes it's too early um, but it's, it's human nature and, and we're all just there to do the best we can and as far as how I deal with it is I just I just don't care <laughs> I, just, I just don't care what people think you know I'm, I'm in there doing the best I can and you know if, if people don't like it just write what you want under the videos thanks <laughs> go to town yeah, yeah so we better uh, get in that, that that other question so from uh, A.A. Ron Fair I'm Aaron assuming from. it's Aaron or Aaron just well, written weird which I yeah yeah well it's Aaron or Aaron or A.A. Ron Fair <laughs> Uh, yes, they should get rid of split decisions and make them draws. Can't trust split decisions, in my opinion. And you had a little bit of an opinion on that before we actually got on air, there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, like s- split de- you like you can. The reason of three judges is to to stop a situation where a fight is a draw, um, and also like, like people have different opinions. There's, tr- there's three individual people who are experienced and who know what they're looking for and have to score with the criteria. But there's there's varying issues. You could be a judge on the far side of the cage where all the action is happening on um, on the opposite side. You could have a person who's defending, if defending a takedown by putting the hand around the back of the neck. And to the judge over there, it can look like a guillotine, whereas you can see he's defending a takedown. Yeah. yeah. Or the impact of blows can sound where the, the judge closest to it it can sound a lot more effective than the judge that's far away and, and some of that play into play into scoring um, but I, I don't think you can take out split decisions because it's three people's opinions and that's what they want individual opinions on it I don't know would I give the uh, what was your analogy about the jurors I said it's <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's like having 12 jurors in a court case and seven of them find them guilty and four of them find him not guilty 
and then you just say it's a draw and let them go. You yeah, know, that's that's not you know kind of nonsensical. Yeah, it's I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it is what it is, and we just have to deal with it. No, so, no, like this is the thing nobody wants a split decision on their record but no, at the end no of judge the day, wants if, a split decision like we exactly, as a judge yeah. we all have we all are on the, the the wrong side of a split decision and there's nothing that actually a judge hates more than being that person like the amount I've been on split decisions and I go back and I watch the fight and I watch and I try and justify my score to myself and sometimes yeah. you say oh I'm wrong like you know and the other two are right and and that's the reason there's two of them there and if the two of them if the two of them see it that way then that's yeah, that, yeah. that's the winner and I'm wrong yeah you know so I've, uh, Derek did you watch the uh, podcast with um, Josh Thompson and um, John McCarthy uh, during the week they were on a they were on their own podcast I think it was yeah I've seen bits of it yeah yeah and um, John was just basically explaining the the, the whole criteria of it and uh, Josh Thompson bi- like was saying well that's not how i've been coaching my fighters for the last few years i've always told them that if they have a position like the back whatever you do don't lose that back position and um it kind of points to the, to the uh, i suppose that the question is should coaches be doing refereeing courses so that they are giving the correct advice when it comes to scoring in these critical junctures in mma fights from the corner um, well, I, I, I do think it's important that all fighters and, and coaches know exactly how the criteria is is being viewed by judges. But also, a course isn't isn't going to teach you everything you know. You know, uh, like we done a course in in two days, but that doesn't that doesn't make you a good judge. Mm. You know, doing a hundred fights doesn't make you a good judge. Doing two hundred fights doesn't make you a good judge. You know, w- we score fights and. Mark would oversee at IMAP, Mark would overview, v- overlook at the scores and he'd come over and he'd question you, why did you give it this way, why did you yeah. give it that way um, and at the beginning you'd be like, oh she had control for, t- and he was like, why did you score on control, like it's, control isn't scored, it's effective striking and you know, and it's like it's like this little bits, he feeds you little bits of information you and you pick it up and as you go on you start you start scoring it differently, and and that's why it takes six, eight, ten years to be a judge with the UFC because you've you've got to learn this and you've got to you've got to figure out where you're going wrong. And same as a fighter, like fighters have to go through an amateur career, twenty, thirty amateur fights, learn all their mistakes before they go in because you can't afford to make a mistake at that level at, at a professional level. Same as judges, like f- it, these these are fighters' careers, and they put their careers are put into our hands as judges so you know we have to we have to make our mistakes at an amateur level or at a novel and, and just learn and try and we're all on a journey to yeah. get better and that's it someday hopefully make all well, my mistakes and we'll move on well we actually have uh, mr ben Doucette from the kitchen i, I <laughs> presume he's cooking food he's always cooking food he's making my chili steak uh, my philly's cheese steak now at the moment but um ben is uh saying uh, what's the hardest part about being an official I, I know you've gone through lots of different features of being an official but what is the one single hardest <coughs> part of the whole job i used to feel that being a referee or being in the cage a lot of pressure on me um and everybody's watching and you know that I used to always I used to feel pressure on that, and the more experience I get, the less pressure I feel in there. Now I feel pressure at being a judge because when those scorecards are being collected, I'm always I'm always second guessing myself at this stage. You know I don't like you know you give your scores and you think, but nobody wants to be that judge that's gotten it wrong. Yeah. Um. And back 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 down to split decisions. We you know there's, you know you don't want to be on that wrong side of a split decision. Um, and and that's where I actually feel kind of the most pressure now is making sure that that I I, I have a hundred percent concentration on these fights, and that I I I use the criteria to the to the letter, yeah. Um, and do the best I can. But that, that I I actually think judging is is nearly a harder a harder um part of being an official now at this stage than as a referee. Yeah, no, um, makes sense. Also, some people have a, a thick skin, and or you know, or some people are. You know, you're not there to, you're you're not there to keep coaches happy. You're not there to keep a certain fighter happy. You're there to make sure that the fight is fair. You're there to make sure that the fight is safe. And it doesn't matter if there's twenty seconds left in the round or one second left in the round. If if you've got to step in, you've got to step in, and that's it. You know, it's 
So you've got to leave every other thing outside the cage and, you know, different focus once you're in there. And of yeah. course, if you make a mistake, you'll have Dino Wade down your back, don't you? Yeah, just like <laughs> for the last five years. <laughs> every time I step into the cage, he shouts, don't fuck this up. <laughs> this up like and that's all i can think about like because i'm staring <laughs> at the outside <laughs> so Very for good. those that are watching if you're not familiar with dino wade dino wade is one of the legends he's the the, the, uh, the uh, what's his role he's kind of like the commissioner of um of all the officials in ireland and he's on the he's the general secretary of uh the irish mixed martial arts association and he's just a he's a he's a legend of the game a true character, character. Yeah. and oh, character, um, yeah so we we We've become friends now over over the years, but many a clash we had at the very beginning, you know, <laughs> two outspoken, you yeah, know, yeah. people that used to just rub each other up the wrong way, and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, uh, like, there, there isn't a person that puts as much work into Irish MMA as Dino, you know, he's just... Flat you know, out. You're never going to find another one of them anyway, that's for sure. <laughs> And is there um is there anything that we need to watch out for for trends going forwards in 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 refereeing? I know we we have like the the, the trend uh, in the last few fights now, and uh, Joe Rogan being the the one calling for it more than anybody else is the ten eights and ten seven rounds, and then we have the changes with regards to the down fighter rule. Are we going to get the soccer kicks back? There's there's a lot. Is there do do you get advanced notice of what's coming down the tracks, and is there anything? That we should be looking out for in the next few years. I don't. I don't. The 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 um the three points of contact as a, as a down fighter that that was changing. And I think the talks were going back to like back to the original uh, one hand and a lot a lot of actual commissions kept it the way it was. Yeah. yeah. Um. As far as soccer kicks, I don't know. I wouldn't be a fan of soccer kicking anybody. Mm. But um, you know, I, I I we don't like uh. Occasionally at IMF, kind of we we have catch ups on Zoom and things like that at the moment, and we, we we talk over it. But um, I I don't see I don't see anything that's coming down the line. Being honest, with the ten eight, the ten eight and ten seven rounds, you were um encouraged to do those at IMF level for a long time, or right? Ten eights, there there should be more ten eights. You know, damage, duration, domination. That's what you look for in a ten eight round. Yeah. Um, as far as a ten seven, I've never even seen a ten seven round, and I'd say. There's very few judges that are confident enough to ever put a ten seven down yeah. on a scorecard. Um, you know, I'm sure there is one or two out there that mm. that. Are, but, but I well, I think the uh, dad of five thousand dying in the middle of the round and then coming back to life that must have been a ten seven. I don't know, maybe a ten eight. Just to be <laughs> sure. And uh, while we need way more ten eights, not as many as Michael Bisping needs when he's watching fights. I was a Bisping. I thought it was uh, Joe Rogan. I, uh, sorry, no, I was. Mike, I was giving Bisping it. called every single round the last time ten eight. Yeah, he's a legend. Though. He can call it yeah. once. <laughs> you know. We enough. do. Need, we do need to get into some fights. Oh, is there before. fights happening as well? Is there? Yeah, we do have some fights this weekend. And we're kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's the name of the show as well as the, the, the UFC uh, Vegas twenty preview. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Go on. Uh, Which so one? in the main event, we have Jersey Neil Rosenstruck versus Cyril Gane, another big heavyweight fight. Taken over from last week when we had the big heavyweight fight. This one is very different, though. Um, two phenomenal strikers. Absolutely phenomenal strikers. Two young... They're not young. They're my age. But they're youngish guys in the heavyweight division anyway. Um, and you've guys that are relatively early-ish in their careers. Mm. Um, and both on phenomenal runs in, in the UFC. Yeah, so I, I think, like, obviously both of them have the knockout power. Um, yeah. I think uh, Rosenstruck has the edge on Ooh. like the one punch knockout power. I think uh, Cyril Gann, while while he has got the power, it's, it, there's there's a little bit more accumulation required from him. Yeah. But having said that, Gann is the one with the footwork. Yeah. He's the one with the, the, the more kicks. I know uh, Rosenstruck has a few head kicks um, on, on his uh, record, but uh, Gann is that he he's just more well rounded in the striking game. A little bit more polished as well. Um, just even like the way he changes it up and works the legs to the body to the mm. head, mm. the his striking is a little bit more polished, but there's certainly more power coming back from Rosenstruck. The big, the big uh, decider here for me, and I, I, it's not that I believe that uh, Gane will finish the fight by submission or that he'll entertain the grappling for the majority of this fight, but he does have a clear advantage in the grappling. Um, so I would imagine that it's something that he will lean on at some point. If he gets rocked, or if if there's 
if, if it's kind of a bit of a stalemate, he does have that to lean on. Um, for me, I, I I just think Gan is the younger fighter. He's uh, no losses on his record. I, I can see him coming in and getting a bit of what would, might be considered he's the betting favourite, but mm. still a bit of an upset in terms of where he is in the division. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I tend to agree with you on this one. Um, and an interesting thing here would be the uh, if Gand does get, get gets if Gand does get past Rosenstruck, are we likely to see a, a match between himself and Ngannou down the line? Uh, two French fighters or two fighters who come through uh, the French MMA circuit, and um, you know that that would be an interesting one. It'd be a good, it'd be an interesting matchup too. But Definitely, uh, you have to take into consideration Rosenstruck. He's had eighty five kickboxing fights as well on top yeah, of his yeah. MMA with sixty four knockouts. Yeah, I mean, so the experience levels are completely different. Um, that's true. Look, that's that's yeah. that's a hundred that's a hundred professional fights with seventy four or seventy six knockouts. Yeah, I mean, so you can't you can't uh, you can't write it you can't write them off. Hundred percent. I I I there's just. Like I said, they're both very technical kickboxers. I just think there's something the way the way Gan Ganya does more more all round work as opposed to uh, Rosenstruck is very effective at what he does. He does the basics phenomenally, and there's a couple of flashy stuff thrown in there. I just think uh, <coughs> Ganya kind of rounds out the game a little bit better, and it's the in between stuff that he's better at. I think he's uh, he's definitely got more more more. W- Tools in the box than uh, Rosenstruck, but I, I, just, I just think he'll get caught. Yeah, it, that's the thing. Like if Gani or if Rosenstruck cut gadgets, that's it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's game over. If either Gany, one, I just think that Rosenstruck has that one, that yeah, one yeah. punch. You know, he, like I mean, look what he did to to Overeem. Like after Overeem destroyed him for five <laughs> rounds, like you know, he, he yeah. separated his two lips. Yeah, yeah. he had three lips there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, like no, like but wings. it's a it's a great fight. Derek, is it is it um? Is there anything you have to do uh, differently refereeing when you're when you've got two heavyweights that can kill each other as a referee? Um, I think you have to be more aware of the amount of shots you're going to let them take once they're on the ground because yeah, yeah. the the power that some of them control, even yeah. from a short distance, hammer yeah. fists, everything. You know, yeah, yeah, like it, it just takes one punch, one yeah. punch too many, and no, nobody ever knows when that punch is. So as soon as like I've refed a couple of he- or heavyweight fights, and as soon as um, as soon as you, they've either given up, or as soon as you've they've six or seven shots have landed, and and there's a lot of power in them. That's that's when I feel like that it's yeah. it's time to step in because you, you just can't take can't take that risk. It yeah. it definitely must be somewhat like the adrenaline must be different to getting in there with two big heavyweights and getting in there with a couple of bantamweights or a couple of featherweights. Like for a referee, the adrenaline has to be slightly different because you're. I actually, not well. I, I f- the only time I kind of actually feel on edge is is world world uh, world championships at the finals. Yeah, yeah. I I actually feel very calm. That's from doing so many fights. Like at the yeah. I used to, I used to be panicking, you know, and sweat. Or like I used to sweat more than the fighters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know. And, uh, not more than me when I was in there. I can fucking guarantee that in there. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's look there. There's a lot of big punchers, and you just have to be super aware of like the damage that yeah, yeah. that that you you allowing that one punch too many can do. Yeah. Um. So it's it definitely makes a difference. One hundred percent. I like. I I wouldn't. But whatever about refereeing a fight, I, I'm not qualified, nor would I ever be qualified. But if I was in there with two heavyweights, I'd be I'd be freaked. Absolutely freaked. Because th- yep. th- it's monsters, like especially when you get to this level, high level in the UFC, they're they're just big guys and they can put people to yeah, sleep in and seconds. And like you go in there, I'm I'm seventeen stone, so I'm not I'm not that small myself, like you know. And these things are just towering over me. Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's uh, it's mad. You know, yeah. So next up, we have the light heavyweight uh, clash between Nikita Krylov and uh, Magomed Ankalaev. Um, the I I. I love the the light heavyweight division at the moment with with um with John Jones out of there. Yeah. I think there's just a a whole new resurgence and and the top 10 guys it's it's almost it, it's not quite light lightweight but it's not too far off it either and when you consider the light heavyweight tournament over in Bellator as well um we we've, we've just uh, like we're we're in 
possibly the golden age of the light heavyweight division, I think, right now. We are being spoiled a bit at the moment, but I think this party would be a little bit sweeter if it wasn't for a certain Israel Adesanya moving into the picture. Mm. Because th- th- there's, I suppose, he kind of casts a bit of a shadow like John Jones would have done. Yeah. No, whether that's right or wrong, w- w- we'll see next week, actually. Um, but he certainly does have a bit of a shadow to cast over the division and, and it kind of puts everything on hold as all the new exciting fighters coming up and what they're capable of. But the minute John Jones left, yes, it looked like there was a multitude of contenders in a division that he had cleared out so much, you know, so yeah. It's exciting and the fight times. then that we wanted, like everybody would love to see is Adesanya and Jones, you know, very stylistic, yep. you know. Yeah. Moving away from each other, yeah. Yeah, which is never going to happen because nobody's going to come back down from heavyweight to, to light heavyweight. I again. can see Izzy going up and chasing him. I really can. I don't know. I, yeah. ju- I, I, I just see Izzy being one of those guys that not, will... Not moving to heavyweight, just going there for, for John Jones alone. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And and definitely, if John Jones does get his hands on that strap, Izzy will move up for it. Mm. He'll go up one and done at heavyweight and, and at least come try and compete with him. But yeah, this this, this fight, like he- heavyweight, like you said, it's a phenomenal fight. And Kalayev off the back of his 18-month... Back and forth with Jan Kutalaba, I'd say he's glad to see the back of him. And yeah. and uh, there's actually four records. There's five records of Jan Kutalaba on his on his um, topology account here, and yeah. three of them are cancellations. Yeah, he's just, just hasn't an been absolute able to saga. escape that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I Ankeloyev has looked absolutely phenomenal since he's got over to the UFC, and we we touched on it yesterday in our prom podcast. Even the loss to Craig. He looked outstanding, and that was in his debut. He looked outstanding against Paul Craig until he just got caught, and Paul Craig is lethal on the mat, mm. so anyone could get caught against him. Yeah, but the the, the one thing I would say about Nikita Krylov is his uh, his experience against uh, top level uh, light heavyweights. I mean, look down through this list here. He's got a loss to, to Glover Teixeira, obviously a win over um, Johnny Walker, but Ovin St. Pru, another another a submission uh, over Ovin St. Pru as well. Yeah, and you, like both Glover and um, Sam Pru have fought for uh, the light heavyweight strap. Yeah. Uh, you have Jan Blachowicz, who is the current, obviously, um, middleweight champ. Um, so, like, even just those, those we say those three, and Johnny Johnny Walker being such a, a, a kind of an unknown a big uh, freak of an a- well, athlete yeah. at all times is dangerous, you know. But, yeah. like, he's he's been tested in the UFC. And I would argue that Ankalaev has not been tested yet. I would put him in the same category as uh, your boyfriend, uh, Mr. Um, <laughs> Hamzad. Mr. Hamzad uh, Chaimev. I, I think that this is the kind of, this is his test. And the, the one thing about um, Ankalaev is, is obviously uh, we r- seen, Russian. We haven't even seen his wrestling because all his, he's no submission wins are. Yeah. It's yeah. So you can guarantee he's got a. But th- this. He has a pedigree to a certain extent, but yeah. I, I think his whole game is I've never met a Russian that can't wrestle, so it's uh, <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, is that with the with the rush with the uh, the wrestling, Nikita Krylov is Ukrainian, and yeah. Yeah. like if there's ever uh, like we know this from the IMAF, Derek, that yeah. like you know the, the the Russians are dominant in 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 the wrestling exchanges, but the the, the Ukrainians are right up there with them. Uh, do you know Ukraine, Kazakhstan, uh, Bahrain, yeah. Moldova. Um, Maldo, yeah, like all of these countries that are close enough near, like the former Soviet bloc countries, they've got lots of wrestling coaches there and a high level of wrestling. So I, I, I think that uh, Krylov may be able to, to, to nullify the wrestling here. And uh, I think this will be his first major test. I'm going to give a nod to Krylov here. Just uh, I, I, I have a soft spot for Ukraine. So yeah, you're, um, that's you're, you're wrong on that one anyway. Well, that we'll is, that is literally the only fight that I'm confident of on this card. <laughs> What's your what's your pick record again, there, Paul? Yeah, it's it's brutal. It's very <laughs> bad. So bad. So yeah, take out a pinch of salt. So we're coming up on the hour here. So let's uh, let let's just do a quick kind of a run through of of the rest of the main card, and then um, if we have any comments or questions from the audience, you can jump them in there. But um, we have the, the the ladies in the the flyweight division: Mon- Montana De La Rosa, uh, Mario Buena Silva. Um, Jesus, that came off uh, very Portuguese there, didn't it? Did a good job. I'm telling you. <laughs> so this is a heavy grappling matchup. You you were talking about this a little bit earlier. Yeah, it, look, the both girls are lean heavily on their submission and their grappling background. Um, neither is very effective on the feet, but both very good at using strikes to get the fight to the mat. I think it's whoever kind of uh, gains that upper hand first could very easily take this fight. 
But oftentimes in these types of fights, they can kind of cancel each other out a little bit on the ground. Mm. And what you end up seeing is a, a fist fight. So yep. maybe that'll be the case. Like Colby Covington and uh, Kamara Usman. Exactly. Um, but d- d- more so this happens when it's grapplers, or, or mm. sorry, when it's heavy wrestlers that, you, that end up striking. So. Do you think they'll start in their arch butt scooting towards each other? <laughs> I mean, like I would, an EBI in, or something. In, in this one, I wouldn't <laughs> be shocked. They are literally, that, that's their world. Um, there, there could be a, a, one of those pats and knuckles and then yeah, just... Yeah. <laughs> just sit down and start yeah, playing yeah. guard. Um, but I, I would lean towards Montana, Montana De La Rosa for the sub win just based on she's more experienced than Buena Silva. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I honestly don't know enough about these girls to have a, an educated opinion. Do you, do you know much about these ones, uh, Derek? No. <laughs> no, fair enough. Short I and sweet. Looking them up last night. Does it make any difference when you're refereeing a fight whether you know the fighter or not? Yeah. Uh, no. So like. In some cases, it has proved to be a disadvantage knowing the fighter because there's there is there's certain fighters that are, as they move later in their career, their left go, uh, their left take excessive strikes. Yeah, I think I think you go down a dangerous road if you're like, oh, he can take, yeah, he yeah. can take um, a, a couple of shots, or he's you know yeah. he's tough. Yeah, but, yeah, you know you you just have to you just have to go with your with your feelings really you know your yeah. gut your gut instincts like that's that's it so i just try and say him like obviously we don't we don't um we don't oversee any fights that teammates or anybody that we'd know kind of personally you know yeah, yeah um whereas in ireland it's a small country and and, and the ma community is small so i mean everybody knows everybody but yeah but like at the end of the day they're both the fighters and they've got a job to do and I've got a job to do you just kind of have to remove yourself from that uh, yeah. knowledge of them yeah yeah and that's it you know it's it's up to them I, you know like I do the same thing for every, every single fight you know so yeah either way I'm going to be blamed so it's only one <laughs> so I'm just going to jump back there we have a comment uh, or a question from uh, Two Middle Tim from SPG Killarney Tim Timothy Kerens, what do you make of uh, another fighter missing weight this week? Is it down to being locked in a hotel before the fight, or is it fighters just being unprofessional? So there was actually just to point to that there was one fighter missed weight by three or four pounds, um, and the name isn't jumping out of me right now. But there was another fight scrapped just before weigh-ins as well because one of the fighters was feeling ill. So between this week and last week, that's I believe six fights in total that have been yeah, affected by f- weight cuts. I think that the Vieira she missed weight by she weighed in at one hundred and thirty eight. I think she was two pounds over or something. Yeah, there was one the guy weighed in over for the the, the weight class above him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. eleven was it eleven, 11 pounds? and a half pounds? Eleven and a half pounds. Yeah, yeah which yeah, is no, absolutely crazy. That was like the time Karen Pepper weighed in with his keys in his pocket. <laughs> he was freaking out. We were after spending about two hours in the sauna trying to get him on weight, and we were sure he was on weight. And then he went in and weighed in. Forgot to take his phone, his keys, oh, his wallet sake. out of his pocket. And when he saw the scales, his face just dropped. It was it was hilarious. But yeah, complete langer, dumb like. <laughs> this is all you get, like you know what I mean. <laughs> we have by, by far the most idiotic fight team <laughs> in the country. <laughs> <laughs> they're good, good scrappers, but they they, they struggle yeah. in the brains department. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Tim, they, sh- they share a brain between them. So Tim, just just from experience, definitely being um, locked up in a hotel room and and uh, and the kind of isolation and th- there is definitely um, there is a, an effect on a, a fighter's ability to to do the the extra cardio they need. They need a lot of fighters like. To, to go for a run Road around work, the hotel yeah. when they land and all of this type of thing. So there's definitely an effect there. But as you say, these guys are professionals. They need to factor this in uh, and just spend more time in the bath. Like every hotel room has a bath in it. They, they're well able, well able to get their Epsom salts, just get it done, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And like if, if it's the case that, you know, a fighter is missing by 11, uh, 11 pounds or um, you know, uh, Vieira missing by two or three pounds when it was such an important fight uh, it, it, when it came to deciding who the next contenders were going to be in the division. If you're if you're that far away and it's all down to a water cut, well, then you haven't been dieting correctly either. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a fighter needs to be like on point and disciplined with their diet right up until uh, uh, like the fight itself, and and that makes the the the, um, the weight cut that much um, more manageable. You know, and more consistent. So. Yeah, I, 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 I would say it sucks to be locked in a hotel room, 
but it's not it's not a valid excuse. It shouldn't be an excuse, yeah, exactly. I think every fighter at that level knows how much water they can cut safely. Mm-hmm. Um, so they know what weight they need to be going to, going out to wherever they're fighting. I don't, I don't think that should be an issue at all. Um, just on on the last three fights on the card, there the, the the Jimmy Rivera versus Pedro Munoz one at bantamweight. Yep, that's gonna be a cracker, an absolute cracker. The, these guys had one of the fight of the year contenders back in two thousand and fifteen. Both have looked good since. They've only lost to elite elite guys in the division. Um, it's got, I, I'm hoping for another back and forth war They're probably not But uh, <laughs> I spoke to Jimmy a few weeks ago And he said realistically That that's what he expects out of this fight He doesn't expect Pedro to go anywhere And their styles match up so well That it's just going to be another one that goes back and forth um, I, And of course I, P- Pedro is a guy that knocked out uh, Cody Garbrandt With three right hands in a row Stiff, yeah yeah That was a, a crazy back and forth And that's the style of fight that Pedro likes To get into those firefights Whereabouts are these guys in the rankings? Uh, they're eight and nine. Okay, so it, it's an important one. So it's, yeah, it's, it's whichever guy wins this moves get a up. Top five, match. yeah. Top five. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an important one for Pedro as well, though, when he's coming off two two fight, fights, two fight losing streak. So, I mean, he's he's starting to. Uh, there we go. Now that's that two fight. He, he's going to be depressed now if he yeah, loses, and it's all to, because of you, Derek. He's trying to skate. He's skating, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, because he's a top ten ranked, though. I'm sure he'll get another a hundred percent, another yeah. bit, but. I mean, there, there's still a bit of panic fighting when, when yeah, his back is to the wall, yeah, yeah. And and I said that to Jimmy when I was talking to him because Jimmy beat Stamen in his last one. But before that, he had the two fights skid. Yeah, he's he two, he lost to Yan. He's after and winning Sterling. two out of his last five. Yeah, so the, the, he knows that kind of pressure that was on him. And I I said, did he expect a bigger fight from Pedro? And he said, look, Pedro's one of those guys that's coming with the fight anyway. It doesn't really but like, make make too much of a difference. When you so. lose to Frankie Edgar and. Elgin Sterling, it's this is you it. have to be given a bit of uh, leeway, yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And 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 the, the the fights Jimmy's lost as well, they're all elite guys, and yeah, they're right there in that division, yeah. 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 So that should be a good one. You have Angela Hill, Ashley Yoder, a good scrap at twenty five, but this this is again one of those ones where both girls have been inconsistent. It's very hard to pick, but I think just of late, even though like that she's on a two fight skid to elite elite girls. I think Angela Hill has probably looked the best she's looked uh, that we've seen her since she first got into the UFC first time around. These girls have fought already as well, haven't they? I don't believe so, no. Uh, I think I saw that in her record a while ago. Um, yeah, so Angela Hill has uh, a win over um, over Ashley Oder in the Ultimate Fighter 25 finale. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you so. are right. I'd completely forgotten about that. Um, see, I, I do my research, you see, Paul. But I, I always get mixed up because it was a finale fight. I just always think it's an ultimate fighter fight. If I see ultimate fighter, I yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. glaze over the bloody thing. Um, Bruce Leroy on the card also. Yeah, fighting Kevin Croom. Kevin Croom was quite vocal about the Nevada State Athletic Commission in his uh, pre-fight interview about getting his suspension for marijuana use. And he said he's been offered for a few months. He, he looks like he's only got one arm here. <laughs> yeah. He made an impressive debut. It was turned to a no contest. I think it's a fresh start for Kevin Crone, but it's a tough test for him. They're both on uh, three fight win streaks too, so yeah. they're. Uh... And it's the first time Caceres has put three fight win streak since way before his UFC career started, which is a long way back now because he was on tough twelve. Yeah, I think that was his last loss was to Cron Gracie. Yeah, twenty nineteen. Yeah, it, it it's the best Caceres we've seen anyway in the UFC. Um, because he had been inconsistent up to this point, but he he's looking like uh, uh that he's good at the moment. And I know Kevin Croom essentially has three wins together, but that that no contest has to play in his mind a little bit as well. So I imagine he's treating this as a bit of a fresh start for. Himself. Isn't Cazares after moving gym as well? And in the coincide with that um that win streak, or or am I thinking of someone else? I don't know that. No. Oh, okay. He possibly has, but I I just it wasn't on my radar. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a whole bunch of cards here. I know Justin Jacoby is the one that jumps out at me down at the bottom here. Yeah. Um, he's been and around a long time. Another fun fight against Maxim Grishin, and Grishin is actually the guy that missed weight for and missing weight for a light heavyweight fight is mm-hmm. Cardinals in number one. Like you're either a heavyweight or you're a light heavyweight. You should have that weight cut down. But then again, Grishin has fought at heavyweight, so yeah, maybe he's unsure of where he should be fighting. Well, maybe as uh, Tim said, he's he's uh, missing the the road running and the saunas. Yeah. 
But as we said, not an excuse. So Middle Tim says, yeah, thinking that sound and a shaka. <laughs> so yeah, next week, of course, we have UFC 259 and the beginning of March Madness and everything that's going to come with that for the next 12 weeks. It's just, it's phenomenal card after phenomenal card after phenomenal card. Uh, you have the start of Bellator, the start of PFL. So lots of content going to be coming your way over on the YouTube channel. We are going to have a lot of new feature uh, shows coming out. So make sure and get over there. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell. And thank you for following us on Facebook as well. Mr. Hickey, do you have any uh, shout outs you want to give? I know your your uh, young Alec at home is playing Grand Theft Auto or, and going shoe shopping. <laughs> yeah, Alec. Stay out of the shoe shops. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go, folks. That has been our uh, preview of UFC Vegas uh, 20. And uh, thanks to Mr. Hickey for coming in and illuminating. Thank you very much. It was actually a good, good conversation. I think I, I think we, we've learned a, a good bit from that and hopefully um, our audience has too. And uh, until next time, we will see you. I want to fight with Chuck. Chuck. I think he just blew his wad there. Anderson Silva, you absolutely suck! Are you still drunk right now? Are you still drunk? I went, but it was all young. This is blue, blue, blue.